All right, welcome to another short video on basic fiber optics. In this one, I've connected a handheld laser to some kind of mystery device right here. And then you can see this device has two output ports that go into each, uh, each of these individual power meters here. So let's figure out what actually happens if I turn on the laser. Certainly some kind of power is gonna be detected on these two devices here, but let's see what, actually, what we actually get. So we turn this on and set it to the right wavelength. And what we notice is that this one shows negative 11.5 dBm, and this one shows negative 10.6. So these numbers are actually quite close to each other. Now, um, this indicates to us that this particular component right here most likely is a 50-50 coupler. So what this means is that when you send optical power into the common white port here, then it gets split almost evenly between these two branches, and then they go into the power meters. So let's think about how that actually happens on a sort of microscopic level. Now, inside of this little metal compartment right here, we actually have um, essentially uh, two sets of fibers here. So we have the input fiber here and the two output fibers over here. Now what happens is that the cores of these two fibers are brought very close together in a particular region here. And as the light wave comes in to this area like so, essentially what happens is that the light wave being an electromagnetic wave has a certain optical frequency. So it's like wiggling the glass material at a certain, certain frequency. And essentially this uh, wiggling reverberates throughout the whole, uh, the whole structure and it can actually cause a little bit of excitation of the glass over here. And essentially some of the light energy gets transferred from this branch into this one. And actually as, as we propagate forward, then more and more of the power that's used to be here actually gets transferred over here. And what can actually happen is that at some point we have all of the power in, in this branch and then it begins to transfer back to the other one. So it gets to leak back here. And essentially this structure here has been um, engineered in a very clever way so that this, let's say the coupling length right here is exactly so long that we have around 50% power here and 50% power here when they begin to diverge. So then we get 50% power out here and 50% coming out right here. So with this in mind, let's actually see what happens if we, let's say we swap these. So instead of sending light into the white current port here, we're gonna send light into the red one and then put this power meter over here and see what happens. So let me disconnect this and put a cap on right here and swap these two. So put this over here and let me make sure that I actually clean this properly. So and that should be tight enough. So you can see the screens, that's pretty good. All right, let's see what happens here. Plug this in, and as you can probably see over here, if it's not cut off, we notice that this one has also negative 11.64 dBm. But wait a second, before, when we had the laser over here and the two parameters over here, we had 11 dBm coming out of the, the blue port and negative 11, sorry, negative 11 coming out over here and negative 11 coming out over here. So we had sort of two units of power coming out, but over here we only have a single unit of power coming out. And this one is completely blank, it's not showing anything because the power is too low to even register anything. So clearly in this case, we've lost some of the power because we have less power now than we had in the, the previous setup. So why is that actually the case? What's well, happening on a microscopic level? Well, essentially because this type of system here is completely reversible, what happens is that if you send 100% power in to this port as we're doing just now, then the same uh, sort of excitation and reverberation and wiggling that goes on right here, uh, when we send in this direction, also goes, take, uh, takes place in the other direction. So initially we have a lot of power in this branch here. Maybe it gets transferred, let's say, 100% over here. And then once we reach this spot here, we once again have 50% here and 50% here. So 50% here and 50% down here. But the way that this um, particular couple is designed is that they simply decided to, let's say, cut off this branch of the, the lower fiber here. So this is like a dead end here. So that power gets, gets lost, doesn't go anywhere. Um, which explains why we only get the sort of 50% of the power we send in coming out, coming out over here. All right, so that explains couplers. Let's move on to another interesting device. Actually, before we move on, I should probably stress that this type of 50-50 coupler isn't the only coupler we can, uh, we can create. 
You can also have, let's say, um, 20 80 couplers where 80% of that goes into one branch and 20% the other one. You could have 1 to 99 couplers where only a tiny bit is sort of tapped off in order to use it for monitoring. You can also design tunable couplers where um, you sort of mechanically separate or bring these two fibers closer together in order to change the, the coupling ratio of the, the outputs here. So many different options that uh, you can get. Anyway, let's move on to the next device. Alright, here we have another mystery device with uh, two ports that are simply labeled as orange and white for now. We also have a handheld data as well as a handheld power meter over here. So first thing I'm gonna push this button here called ref which should normalize everything to the power coming in. There we go. So now I'm gonna disconnect it here and plug it into the orange port. Let me make sure I also clean it. Just like a measure. Oops, there we go. Let's hook this up right here and do the same thing here. And see what happens. Oh, looks like this one decided to go into sleep mode. Let me wake it back up. There we go. Okay, so we can see that right now we only have one decibel of loss, which is fairly small, so clearly whatever this device does, it doesn't actually prevent very much light from going in here. And we can see that it's not a question of the polarization of the light, because if I twist and turn this fiber here, you can see nothing really nothing really changes over here. Normally if you strain a fiber, then the state of polarization changes, and then you can get a different result, but here clearly it's polarization independent. All right, let's see what happens if we reverse the direction of this component right here. So we flip the white and orange ports around. Clean these guys again, just to be on the safe side. There isn't really any true danger of anything burning or being damaged by these very low powers we're using for this laser here. But if you're doing fiber optics, I recommend that even if you're using just like simple low power systems, you might as well clean everything thoroughly because then you're not going to forget it when you use uh, anything that's like high power that has a risk of, of burning. So anyway, let's plug this in right here and see what happens over here. So that's kind of odd, right? You can see clearly the laser's on here, but now we're measuring just low. So basically no power is making its way through. So what's uh, what's going on here? Well, this type of device here is actually called an isolator. Oh, it's actually, let me rotate this here to see what the label says here. So an isolator is simply a device that has a very high transmission in one direction, but a very high attenuation in the other direction. As you can see from the label here, it says around 1 dB in the forward direction, which is what we measured, and 60, negative 60 dB in the other direction. So if you try and send light in here, it gets reduced by a factor of 1, 1 billion. Now, why would we care about having such a device? Well, if you have a fiber optic system where you're sending light, let's say from an amplifier out into the system, and you don't want light being back reflected and entering the amplifier and screwing that up, then placing an isolator after the amplifier is like really, really helpful. So it's sort of, it's a one-way street making sure that light only moves in the forward direction, and if it tries to move in the back direction, it gets very heavily attenuated. So let me uh, just pause the video and open the box so you can actually see what the, the device looks like. So here I've opened the box, and you can see this, uh, the actual isolator is inside of this little metal tube right here. Now, the plastic box isn't really necessary at all. This is just a um, sort of a lab practicality to take a lot of the commonly used devices that can be kind of sensitive and then place them inside of these plastic boxes that we just custom made. Now the reason why, at least uh, I think this is a good idea, is that if um, you have a laboratory with a large number of different students and professors and whatnot, then they're all setting up different experiments at any given time, taking them apart and moving components around. So if you put things inside of these plastic boxes and very clearly label them, it's very easy to figure out which device has been used where and what kind of components you even have available to, to do experiments. Because if you don't label things, don't keep them organized, then it's really easy to lose track of, do we have this? attenuator here, do we have this isolator here, what kind of coupler is this? But if you put labels on, it makes the whole workflow a lot, a lot easier. So maybe I'll actually, uh, just on the paper here, I'll also sketch out how this isolator works on a sort of microscopic level. All right, see you in a bit. Okay, here we see a simplified model of how an isolator works on a microscopic scale. Essentially, we have an input beam of light hitting a birefringent crystal, which is essentially a crystal where the speed of light along one axis of the, uh, the crystal is different from the one along another axis. 
Essentially, this means that if we send the beam in in the correct way, then it gets split up into a component that's polarized along the sort of horizontal direction here, and a component that's polarized along the, the vertical direction. These two then get set into a what's called a Faraday rotator, which is a component that rotates the polarization of light by a certain amount, and the length of it is chosen in such a way that it essentially gets rotated by both get rotated by 45 degrees. So it's kind of hard to see with my hand here, maybe if I zoom out a bit. But the idea is that if this one here is pointing up and this other one here is pointing forward, then they both get rotated by 45 degrees, like so, when they reach the, the upper over here. Then at that point, the two light beams that are spatially separated will hit a different birefitting crystal. Now you can see that they have different polarizations that are sort of angled. And because of the special way that this crystal here is cut and the axis that it has for its uh, high speed of light and low speed of light, these two beams actually be merged perfectly right here and then sent to the, the common output right there. So now let's think about what happens if we send light in in the other direction. Alright, so here we see the same isolator but in reverse. So now we're sending light into this birefitting crystal first, then through the Faraday rotator and then back towards this crystal over here. So in this diagram we're going to assume that initially the polarizations down here are identical to the ones we have up here, so you should think about this as one polarization being at 45 degrees in this way and the other one being at 45 degrees the other way. I don't know if my hands are really conveying this, but I'm sure you can imagine it. Then what happens is that, uh, is that the birefringence of this crystal again causes the beam to split up into the, the two components and these go into the Faraday rotator. But now instead of rotating back to the original position identical to the one we had up here, they actually experience the same rotations before in the same direction. So now this beam that's, that's right here is polarized in the direction sort of perpendicular to the, the sheet of paper right here, whereas the other one gets polarized in the, um, in the direction along the in the plane of the paper. So what does that mean? Well it means that when they hit this birefringent crystal then the, um, the bending angle it experiences no longer matches the one that it had up here. So this beam is actually going to go up and then totally miss this uh, dashed line that represents the input direction of the, uh, the component here. So this beam here simply just goes and hits a brick wall. It doesn't actually go into the input port here and then out the other end. And sort of the same thing happens for the, the lower beam here. It doesn't have the, the correct polarization right here to follow the path that would lead it up here. It just goes in here and hits a brick wall and then gets, gets lost. So essentially this is the, um, the beauty of this Faraday rotator. It's that it's, um, it's sort of, it, um, you can tell the difference between going forward and going backwards. In some sense if it sends light in this direction it's going to rotate it by 90 degrees clockwise, and if it goes in here, it's also going to rotate 90 degrees clockwise, and therefore we get this nice behavior where a beam coming in this direction gets split up, rotated, and then merged again. But if the same beam goes in the, uh, as up here, goes in the other direction, it gets rotated in the same direction, but then the uh, two constituent beams here no longer hit the, the input here, and they just get, get dumped. Okay, right here we have another mystery device that I have uh, secured in place with the most important tool in any fiber optics lab, namely ordinary scotch tape. So you can probably imagine that if you have a large setup with a lot of fibers going many places, then uh, there's a huge risk of it turning into a big plate of spaghetti or potentially something getting snacked on one of the fibers and then tearing the whole um, setup to, to, the, to the ground. So therefore, using just ordinary tape to fix everything in place is actually a really good, really good householding tip here. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about tape, I'm here to talk about this device here. Now, it has three ports. This is port number one, this is port number two, and port number we, this is actually how the manufacturer has labeled, labeled all of them. It's probably too small to see, but it says port 2 right here. So anyway, let's see what actually happens if we turn on the handheld laser right here. So as you can probably see, we get a lot of power into this port, but almost nothing inside of this one. So that's kind of interesting. So we can see lots of power goes into port number 1 and comes out of port number 2. Now let's see what happens if we, instead of sending light into port number 1, send it to port number 2, which means we swap this laser with this power meter right here. So let me do that real quick. Shouldn't take too long. So let's put this around. And as always, we clean the end faces. I know this is a little bit pedantic and maybe a bit boring to watch, but it is a really good thing to keep in mind. Because remember that a lot of equipment that you use in fiber optics can actually be quite expensive. Um, we have amplifiers and detectors that are worth like tens of thousands of dollars. So you spend just like two seconds cleaning a fiber and making sure that nothing burns, it can actually save you a lot of money and save you a lot of trouble in the long run. Okay, so now we, to, we swap these two around. Let me hook this one up. 
Oh, looks like the battery fell out. <laughs> Let me just plug that back in. So it has to go like this. There we go. No harm done. Okay, so we can see for this one, we actually get most of the power going into port number two and coming out of port number three over here. So as you can see, we have actually, what's that, like a 20 decibel difference here. So only 1% of the power goes into this one, and most of the power actually goes into, into this one now. Which is kind of strange, right? Because when we sent the, the power into this one, we saw all of it went into this port right here. But if we send it back, it doesn't actually behave linearly. It doesn't really go back the same way it came. It actually goes into a new direction, which is over here. And finally, let's actually see what happens if we swap port number 2 and port number 3. So we send light into port number 3 now. Let's see what comes out of 2 and 1. So let's clean this up. I should probably also emphasize that if you're dealing with high power, which is like anything above, say a couple of tens of milliwatts maybe, you should probably not clean the vibrants while the lasers are active, because that can actually cause you to, to burn them. So if you're dealing with anything more than just like a handheld simple laser here, probably just to turn everything off, then clean it, plug it in, turn it back on. Anyway, so let's do this one. So let's clean this one up. Pick this guy back up. They tend to uh, turn off after a while to conserve battery, which can be a little bit inconvenient sometimes. So let me resolve this mess out right here. We should be able to see that we now have light coming out of the laser right here. And you can see nothing seems to go into port number one over here, and nothing seems to go into, or at least a very small amount, it seems to go into port number, port number two over here. So what's actually going on? Clearly we have some kind of device that takes light into port number one, and since it's a port number two, it can also take light from port number two and send it into port number three. But if light comes from port number three, it just disappears and gets lost in here. So what's actually going on? Let's think a bit about this. Well, essentially what we have here is called a circulator. And we're actually based on some of the same uh, principles that we used for the, um, for the isolator. But it's a little bit more involved, so I'll just link to some resources that explain it in more detail. Essentially, when we draw diagrams of optical setups, we represent circulators like this. So a circle, we have a input here, port one, that goes to port number two, and then this one goes back into port number three, like so. So basically the idea is that a circulator allows you to send light into a device over here. So this is some device. And then you can of course measure the transmission that comes out here. But if you want to measure the reflection, then you have to use the circulator because it sends the light from the device back here. Instead of going back into port number one, it exits through port number three, and then you can have another sort of detector over here to catch the light and then analyze it. So circulators are extremely useful devices used in many different uh, setups. So it's really nice to sort of understand how they work on a, on a practical level. All right, I think that was the final device I wanted to show you today. Stay tuned for more videos.